So glad to see all of you here this morning. Thank you so much for all the loving messages in the parking lot today. <laughs> I do feel loved and appreciated, and I hope you feel the same way. So last week we talked about how important it is for Christians, especially for Christians, to be resilient. And resilient means that we can go through hard times and still be okay. More than be okay, we can thrive. We don't let hard times defeat us. That's what it looks like to be resilient. We want to have a faith that is resilient because that kind of faith keeps us from being tossed back and forth by the waves, right? Whenever some, something happens, we're like, oh, no, it's a crisis. You know, and we want to be able to be steady no matter what's going on around us. And it is that kind of faith that enables us to do that, that sustains us. And so that's what it looks like to be resilient. So the good news about resilience is that even if you didn't grow up having it, you can learn it along the way. You can develop resilience now, no matter how old you are or what kind of experiences you've had in your life or no matter what your personality is, resilience is a learned trait. There's really four important components to resilience, and this month we're studying all four of those, okay? So, because by the end of the month, I expect all y'all to be more resilient than you were at the beginning of the month, okay? Right? <laughs> so, the first component of resilience, you may remember from last week, is hope. And hope is the confident expectation of something good, no matter what it looks like at the time. Many of us have seen how God has brought good out of difficult situations in our lives. And we know that the God of hope works in us to bring about his purpose. Do you remember that he works all things together for the good of those who love him and who are called according to his purpose? We also know that Jesus came into this world as the light of hope so that we could have access to heaven and to God, you know, the God that we separated from when we sin. And Jesus came to restore that relationship and to give us the hope of heaven. And for me, what that means is that even when things in this world aren't going well, even when things here are bad, I still have the hope of heaven. The confident expectation that that's where my inheritance is, that that's where I'm going to spend eternity. Don't you feel that way too? And so this life sometimes seems long and hard, but it's small and temporary compared to what we're going to receive in heaven one day. And the hope of that gets us through all kinds of things, doesn't it? So hope is very important to being resilient. You have to have something that you trust in that it's going to be better down the line. And the next component of resilience that I want to talk to you this morning about is commitment. And it's a funny thing about commitment. In order to have commitment, you really need to have hope because you can be committed to the wrong things and that doesn't make you resilient, right? But when we have hope and our commitment is based on that, then that's a powerful side to be on, right? So let me just make sure we understand the word commitment. Commitment is defined as the obligation to do something that is to act regardless of emotion. Let me say that again. Commitment is defined as the obligation to do something or to act regardless of emotion. So when I'm committed to something, I'm going to show up no matter how hard it is. And I'm going to show up without excuses. I'm going to put it into action. Whatever my hope is, I'm going to put that hope into action, not because I feel like it, but because I know what I know what I know, and I'm committed to it. I'm committed to being the person that I'm supposed to be and to doing the things that God has called me to do because I know that I belong to him. That's commitment. God, what God wants out of me matters more than all the slings and arrows that come in my way. Do you feel that way too? Life can be tough. 
And we can have a lot of different options. But what matters most is what does God want from me in this moment? For a great example of what that looks like, I want to talk to you this morning about the story of Daniel. And we can read about Daniel in his book in the Old Testament. Daniel has his own book, right? All right. And it's in the Old Testament. It's called Daniel. And let me just give you a little background because Daniel was a Jew. He was an Israelite, okay? He was one of God's chosen people. And in those days, the people of Israel had largely turned away from God. So God had done all of these miraculous things to bring them to their own country, to their own land, so that they could show the world what it looked like to belong to God. And time and time again, we see that the Israelites turned away from God. They started compromising. They started accepting what the rest of the world did around them. And they started to become like the world instead of becoming like God. This is the condition of Israel when Daniel was living. So as a result of that, Israel got taken captive by the land of Babylon and King Nebuchadnezzar, right? So Nebuchadnezzar comes in and conquers Israel, and this was their tradition for Babylon. They would take the best and brightest of the lands they conquered and bring them back home in order to indoctrinate them in their ways. So they wanted to take them out of their previous culture and make them a part of Babylon so that they would be loyal to Babylon instead of being loyal to their home country. Does that make sense? So Daniel and his friends were some of those that were carried off into Babylon. And they were, um, this is where we pick up the story. And I'm going to read to you from Daniel chapter 1, starting with verse 2. And I'm going to read from the New Living Translation. Um, you're welcome to read along with me. About Daniel, about the king of Babylon, it says, The Lord gave him victory over King Jehoiakim of Judah and permitted him to take some of the sacred objects from the temple of God. So Nebuchadnezzar took them back to the land of Babylonia and placed them in the treasure house of his God. And then the king ordered Ashpenaz, his chief of staff, to bring to the palace some of the young men of Judah's royal family and other noble families who had been brought to Babylon as captives. Select only strong, healthy, and good-looking young men, he said. Make sure they are well-versed in every branch of learning. They're gifted with knowledge and good judgment and are suited to serve the royal palace. Train these young men in, men in the language and literature of Babylon. The king assigned them a daily ration of food and wine from his own kitchens. And they were to be trained for three years, and then they would enter the royal service. Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah were four of the young men chosen, all from the tribe of Judah. The chief of staff renamed them with these Babylonian names. Daniel was called Belteshazzar. Hananiah was called Shadrach. Mishael was called Meshach. Azariah was called Abednego. But Daniel was determined not to defile himself by eating the food and wine given to them by the king. He asked the chief of staff for permission not to eat those unacceptable foods. Now God had given the chief of staff both respect and affection for Daniel, but he responded, I'm afraid of my lord the king who has ordered that you eat his food and wine. If you become pale and thin compared to the other youth your age, I'm afraid the king will have me beheaded. Daniel spoke with the attendant who had been appointed by the chief of staff to look after Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, and Azariah. Please test us for 10 days on a diet of vegetables and water. And at the end of the 10 days, see how we look compared to the other young men who are eating the king's food. Then make your decision in light of what you see. The attendant agreed to Daniel's suggestion and tested them for 10 days. At the end of the 10 days, Daniel and his three friends looked healthier and better nourished than the young men who had been eating the food assigned by the king. So after that, the attendant fed them only vegetables instead of the food and wine provided for the others. And God gave these four young men an unusual aptitude for understanding every aspect of literature and wisdom. And God gave Daniel the special ability to interpret the meanings of visions and dreams. 
And that ability would take Daniel far in the future into serving the king. But did you hear what he did? Daniel resolved, that is, he committed to stay true to God by not defiling himself with the unhealthy food of Babylon. And the result was that he and his friends were healthier and of greater value to the king than anyone else. And so even in captivity, they stayed true to what God wanted for them. And God took care of them, didn't he? And this was just the beginning for Daniel and his friends. If you read the rest of the book, you know, right? But in chapter 3, you can read about what happened to his friends who were now called Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The king had passed a law that everyone had to bow down to this golden statue that he had made. And as God's people, it was not okay for them to bow down to another statue or a false god. And so Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego refused to bow down. And the king called them into his court to see him, and he said, I'm going to give you one last chance. Bow down and worship this idol, or I will have to throw you into the fiery furnace. Imagine if you were them standing in that moment. Bowing down is just a symbol. Am I willing to lose my life? But the three friends stood firm. And here's what they said. This is Daniel 3.16. O Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God whom we serve is able to save us. He will rescue us from your power, your majesty. But even if he doesn't, we want to make it clear to you. Your majesty, we will never serve your gods or worship the golden statue you have set up. Does that sound like commitment to you? The king had them thrown into the fiery furnace then for disobeying his law. And that furnace was so hot that the soldiers who put them in the furnace died from the heat. Do you remember what happened next? The king looked into the fiery furnace and he saw them. Not just Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, but a fourth who was like God walking around in the fiery furnace. We know that's Jesus, right? walking around in the fiery furnace. And so he had the doors open, and he let them out. And when they came out, they did not even smell like smoke, right? They'd just been having a time of worship in there, right? (laughs) How awesome is that, that Jesus was right there with them? Do you see? They They stayed true to their commitment to God, and he took care of them. A similar incident would happen to Daniel then in chapter 6. And this is not Nebuchadnezzar. It's actually two kings later. And some people talked the king into issuing this new decree that said that nobody in the land could pray to anybody other than King Nebu- or to whoever the king was at the time. You were not allowed to pray. But Daniel kept on praying. In chapter 6, verse 10, it says this. When Daniel learned that the law had been signed, he went home and knelt down as usual in his upstairs room with its windows open toward Jerusalem. He prayed three times a day, just as he had always done, giving thanks to his God. And then it says Daniel was committed to God and did not turn away. He didn't turn away, no matter what the cost. And so do you remember what happened to him? He got thrown into the lion's den. The lion's den was a place where no one could survive, right? It was done for sport. People were thrown in and the lions would eat them. There was no chance Daniel could survive the lion's den. But he did. He was not even harmed. And he said that God sent an angel to close the mouths of the lions. When the king went to the lion's den the next day, he found Daniel still alive. And as a result, that king prayed.
praised the living God of Daniel whose kingdom would never be destroyed. You see, Daniel, like his friends, stayed true to his commitment and God took care of him. Do you believe that God does that? I do. I think this is proof. And these are extreme, extreme examples of commitment, aren't they? But I think this is the kind of commitment that God wants from us. It's the attitude of commitment that helps us to be resilient in our faith, no matter what. No matter what. And maybe you're thinking, well, I could be committed. I don't think I'd fall for that. I wouldn't bow down and worship somebody else. But are there other ways that we compromise our values? Are there ways that we let the world slip in? Or all of a sudden we start to look more like the world around us than we do like Jesus? Are you willing to be committed to your faith then? When you have the hope that God has a good plan and a good outcome in store for you, and you couple that with your commitment to stay true to him until that outcome arrives, then you have resilient faith. You are well on your way. And this is what I think it talks about when the Bible says that we should love God with all our heart and all our mind and all our soul and all of our strength. That's what it looks like, being committed to him, fully committed to him, not room for anything else. And this is how he's wired you to be, to be committed to him. If you're not living out that kind of resilience, then I want you to know that you are missing the life he designed for you. He wants you to be faithful. If you're living in defeat or you're wandering lost because you're not really committed to his plan, you are missing the beauty of life with Jesus. No wonder so many people around us are struggling to find their identity and their joy because they're not committed to doing things God's way. No wonder they are floundering instead of thriving. That's not how God wants us to get through this life. He doesn't want us to flounder, to struggle, to suffer because we can't do the right things. He wants us to prosper. He wants us to have joy. He wants us to have peace, even when things are hard, even when there is struggling, even when there is suffering. I know that a lot of you have shown that kind of commitment to Christ. I've seen it. This morning, I thought it would be good for us to hear a story of one of us who has shown extraordinary commitment through his life. And so this week, I sat down and talked with Tyson about what commitment looks like. And I would like to share that video with you. Will you watch with me? I had a stroke when I was 17 years old. I was in a coma. And my mom told me that the doctors informed her that it's the worst coma ever. So I could have died at any minute. <laughs> so she had to be prepared for me to die. And a minute, and then the doctors, then they stated, well, we'll do surgery on him because he's going to die 100% if we don't do surgery. And then he might come out of the coma if I do surgery. So they did surgery, and they expect me to come out of a coma, and I did not come out of a coma. And I think it's because God was not through with me yet that... <laughs> That guy still had a little work to do, so I stayed in the coma for for another two months, and then I woke up, and then it was funny, because I was wheeled into the doctor's office and in my gurney, and he said, well, you are a miracle that you're still here, that you're living and all this stuff. You're a miracle, I said, <laughs> and I was thinking, you don't know half of what's going to happen. <laughs> uh, even after I did therapy for a year, for about, no, for about six months, the doctor said, the doctor came up to me and said, at that time I was in a hard back chair, wheelchair, because I didn't have any balance. So, and the doctor came to me with the catalog and said, 
we're going to get you another wheelchair, and you better get a real comfortable one because you're going to be in it for the rest of your life. And, uh, and I just said, no, I'm not. I'm not going to be in a wheelchair for hardly any time at all. So I got the most uncomfortable wheelchair you could find. Uh, it was a chair with two boards in it. That was my wheelchair. A board on the seat and a board on the back. And that was my wheelchair. And I just knew I was going to get out of that wheelchair as soon as I could. So I didn't need a big old elaborate wheelchair. So you were very committed to your recovery. I was. Yeah. I still had that competitive nature in me that any, any little thing was just a problem. It wasn't. <laughs> something was not wrong with me. It was just a problem that I needed to overcome. <laughs> yeah. So, what other things are you committed to in your life now? Well, right now, definitely I'm committed to Jesus. Uh, I'm committed to working out every day. The reason why I go and work out every day is that I found out that when I'm out in the street, People don't treat me right, don't treat me like a human being. But when I'm in the gym, they see my heart and they see that I can outlift most of the people there. I'm always up to doing anything that God wants me to do. If God's in it, there's no limit. Do y'all think Tyson's committed? Yeah. Yeah, last year he said he was getting a motorcycle, and we are all like, you can't have a motorcycle. And he's like, no, I'm getting a motorcycle. I don't think you should have a motorcycle. And you know what? Tyson's got a motorcycle. <laughs> but you see, this is a picture of commitment. It's not a life that has no problems. It is a life that says, if there is a problem, I'm going to look for the solution instead of picking out the most comfortable wheelchair and resolving to sit in it for the rest of my life. And Tyson, we're so thankful that you're part of our family and that you give us that example every time you're here because you show up for church. Tyson is committed to being here, isn't he? Every time the doors are open, right? <laughs> yeah. I think our world needs more commitment like that. I think our faith needs to be committed like that to say, I don't care what you say about me. I'm going to stay faithful to God because that's where my commitment lies. Oh, how different our world might be, how different our country might be if Christians would stand up and be committed to not just to our faith but to what is right. This week I watched a documentary on what's going on on our southern border with all the immigrants that are coming through, and I want to tell you the truth. It is evil. What's going on in our country today is pure evil. Children are being drugged and brought into our country to be trafficked. Criminals are being allowed to enter without being registered or anything, free to commit the same crimes they'd committed before in our country. The cartels are getting rich by trafficking people and drugs into our country. This is evil. The immigrants who come here are often victims of crime along the way. Some of them are murdered. Others are raped and robbed or extorted. And all kinds of other crimes are committed against them. Some are just pawns in this game that funnels millions upon millions of dollars into the pockets of those who are helping them, including the nonprofits, including those that have Christian names. This is a humanitarian crisis that's going on in our nation, which I believe is fueled by a political agenda whose goal is to weaken our country, to turn it away from the values of God. I wonder how many Christians are complicit in this crisis. Not those who are, just, who are actually committing the crimes, but those who stand by and watch without doing anything or without speaking up. Over and over and again in this documentary, as they interviewed people and said, you realize what you're doing, and the response they typically got was, I'm just doing my job. 
You see, somewhere along the line, they got more committed to a job than they did to having human decency. Somewhere along the line, they were convinced that it wasn't their fault or that it was noble to do a job to support yourself or your family, even if that job meant that other people were going to be dead or victimized as a result. I'm just doing my job. They know what they're doing is wrong, but they're not committed to doing what is right. Do you think that Daniel and his friends would have gone along with something like that? Do you think that Daniel and his friends would have said, well, we can't help it. It's the king. You know, what are you going to do? They threatened the fiery furnace, so we bowed down. No, they wouldn't do those things, right? They stood up for what was right. They stayed committed to the truth, no matter what the consequences. And you know why they did that? Because they had the hope in a God who would save them, either in this world or the next. My friends, that's how we should be. We should never stand silent in the face of evil and think there's nothing I can do. We need to stand up for God for his values, and for what is right, even if it costs us dearly. I don't want to gain the world but lose my soul, do you? We need to be committed to Christ. God is looking for people who have a committed faith, the kind of faith that says, I will serve him and I will honor him no matter what. But what if I lose my job? Do you think God can take care of you? If God can pull Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego out of that fiery furnace without even smelling like smoke, do you think God can provide for you because you're not willing to take a paycheck to do what is wrong? I think God is able. Surely our God is able to rescue us. And even if he doesn't, I will still serve him. Because I have the hope of heaven and a better life to come. Are you committed today? Are you committed to him that way? I don't think we can be soft anymore. I don't think we can sit back and be thankful that we're in Tennessee and this doesn't really impact us so much. I think we have to realize that there is a battle going on. And if the battle is going to be won, it will be because Christians stand up for what is right and what is true and what is good and what is noble, no matter the cost. So let me leave you with another scripture from Paul that talks about resilience in our faith. And this one's from the NIV. Paul says, I want to know Christ. Yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, But I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not yet consider myself to have taken hold of it. But one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. Brothers and sisters, press on. Press on. Stay committed. And I was thinking about this and, and about how many of us are facing so many struggles in our lives and in our homes. And we're going to have a time of prayer at the end where you can come to the altar and, and where you can receive encouragement and prayer to do that with your struggles. But before I want to do that, before I do that, I want to ask you something. Is your home committed to Christ? Have you made a stand for what is right in that part of your life over which you have control? Because maybe if all of us had homes that were committed to Christ, we would all become a community that's committed to Christ. And maybe if all of our communities were committed to Christ, we would become a state that was committed to Christ. And maybe if we had a state that was committed to Christ, we would see other states that would become more committed to Christ. Do you see? Where does it all start? It starts in your home. If you can't make a stand for Jesus in your home, how are you going to make a stand for him out in the world? Because you have already compromised. And so today I want to give you this opportunity. 
and I have prepared something for you. For each household, we have a bottle of oil that I would like for you to take with you today. And Greg and Susan are going to be passing these on. So if you, all, if you live together with other people here, if you'll just take one, that would be cool. If you're watching and you want one of these, email me or call me. I'll bring it to you, right? But we're going to take a stand in our homes for Christ. Can you guys do that? And so what I want you to do is to take this oil to your home. And this oil is, it has frankincense and there's one called white angelica that's supposed to be for protection. And I'm going to tell you why we're doing that. Do you remember the story of the Israelites when they were slaves in Egypt? And God told them that he was about to rescue them, but the angel of death was coming. And so what they did was they took the blood of a sacrificial lamb and they smeared it over the doorposts of their home. Then when the angel of death came, he flew over their homes without taking any lives because he knew that that home was committed to God. You remember that story? So that's what we're going to do with the oil. See, isn't that much nicer than blood? I think this is much better. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to smear it over the doorposts of our homes. And so while you do that, then I want you to say a prayer. And so you should have gotten oil and a card. And on the back of this card is a sample prayer. You don't have to pray this, but if you're not sure what to pray, pray this, okay? And basically what it's doing is asking for God's protection over your home. And what I would like for you to do while you are doing that is to take a picture. Now, you don't have to all stand in front of your doorway and do a cheesy grin, right? But, you know, maybe it's just a picture of your hand with the oil growing across your door, or maybe it's a picture of your family praying together. Some kind of picture that says, I'm committed. And then if, you're on, if you do that social media thing, I would challenge you to post it on your feed and on the Generations of Grace feed with the hashtag that says, I'm committed. Okay. I think we need to take a stand for our homes. I think we need to stand for good and not evil, and it starts right where we lay our heads at night. And some of you may not have control over who lives in your home. You can do it in your room, right? You can ask for God's protection, even if there are things that you know are not right inside. And you can pray over and over again for him to get, make evil leave. Not make people leave, make evil leave, right? Will you do that with me? I think it will be very exciting for us to show the world that this is what it looks like to be Christians who are committed to our faith. We're going to dedicate ourselves and our homes. And if you have oil left over, you can put it on all the people. <laughs> yeah, you can anoint the door of your car, you know, whatever you think, just anoint away, okay? <laughs> I think God wants us to be committed. I may not be able to change the world. I may not be able to change what's going on in our border. But I can have an influence in my home. I can stand up for God right here. That's where it all begins. We're going to pray this morning. And I hope that you will bow your heads and pray with me and tell God I'm committed. Will you? Let's bow our heads. Father God, we thank you so much for, for Daniel and Shadrach and Meshach and Abednego and for Tyson and for these examples of what it looks like to stand firm even in the face of suffering. Father God, forgive us for the times when we have turned the wrong way, when we have looked the other way, because we didn't trust you to take care of us. Father, I pray that you would give us boldness to do what is right, to say what is right, to speak truth in this world, and to never look at evil and say it's my job or it's none of my business. Help us to stand right, stand firm, to keep praying to you as is our usual. Lord, we lift up our homes to you. We pray that your spirit would dwell in there. But God, we know that your spirit will not dwell where there is evil. 
And so help us, Lord. Help purge our homes of anything that doesn't honor you. Help us to be committed to you with love and joy, not in a way that condemns other people, but in a righteous way that just says, God is good and I trust him and I, he will take care of me no matter what. And Father, we raise our hands. If you're committed to him, would you just raise your hand right now? Lord, you see our hands. We are committed to you, God. We are your children. We will not waver in our faith. We will not waver in doing what is right because we belong to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.